name is Eli Weaverdick. I'm currently at the University of Freiburg. And the topic of my presentation is a method of comparative locational analysis that I've developed uh, to test the importance of a specific historical phenomenon, uh, specifically marketing and the different types of marketplaces um, at a regional scale. Um, I should start by saying I'm not a data scientist, so my choice of statistical methods was driven strongly by my research objectives, uh, marketing theory, and what other archaeologists have used in the past. And so I'm hoping that some of the people here can help me improve this. Uh, the data I use in this presentation come from two different areas, and not only from two different widely dispersed areas, but from two very different projects. And they differ in a number of important ways, but one of the goals of my analysis is to make them comparable despite their differences. The historical question that drove me is about the relationship between Roman auxiliary forts and the people who lived in the countryside in the Roman frontier zone. In the first and early second century CE, the Roman Empire lined the Rhine and the Danube with large legionary fortresses and numerous smaller auxiliary forts. In contrast to the Mediterranean basin, much of this area had hitherto been uh, sparsely populated, populated and little urbanized, so the imposition of military infrastructure and hundreds of thousands of soldiers was a major shift, to say the least. Documentary and archaeological evidence demonstrate that these forts and fortresses, along with the civilian settlements that grew up beside them, were densely populated, socially diverse places with access to long-distance exchange networks, coined money, and manufactured goods. In short, they looked a lot like towns. The question I wanted to answer was, did they act like towns in their local economic landscapes? I was particularly interested in the auxiliary forts because they were so numerous and sometimes very densely packed along the rivers. If people in the countryside could sell their produce at these forts, they would have had access to multiple wealthy marketplaces, which would have enhanced their bargaining power relative to peasants with access to only one market. In the 1970s, when archaeologists started experimenting with spatial analysis, marketing was one of the first topics they took on. Colin Renfrew, for example, developed fall-off curves, patterns of decreasing artifact frequencies with increased distance from the place of exchange, while Ian Hodder and Mark Hassel compared the distribution of towns in Roman Britain to different idealized lattices derived from central place theory. These attempts relied on visual comparison with empirical data and were difficult to quantify or test. Ian Hodder and Martin Millet applied Renfrew's idea of fall-off curves to villas in Roman Britain to demonstrate that administrative centers exerted influence at greater distances from other towns, but it is unclear whether this was related to economic or other social and political factors. In addition, they only took into account the influence of a single center on each rural settlement, so it's not applicable to my question. Finally, no account was taken of other factors that might influence settlement location. Later methods were developed by K.G. Hearth and then Barbara Stark and Christopher Garrity. Hearth proposed that analyzing artifact assemblages from households with differing social statuses could identify market exchange, while Stark and Garrity build on Hearth by incorporating evidence for specialized production of widely distributed quotidian objects. But the goals of these researchers were primarily to identify the existence of market exchange rather than to study the individual places of exchange. They depend, furthermore, on systematic samples of artifacts from a large number of households across large areas, and therefore can only be applied in areas with a long history of rural archaeology, which is true of only parts of the Roman northern frontier. In order to understand the marketing role of specific centers, it must be demonstrated that certain classes of objects were acquired only or primarily from those centers. Furthermore, they require that the objects of commercial exchange include durable artifacts. We can easily imagine, however, exchanges of agricultural produce for perishable goods or money that may or may not enter the archaeological record at the place of production. Durable artifacts are proxies for market exchange that are contingent on a variety of factors. However, the distance traveled between farm and marketplace is a structural constraint. Spatial analysis of settlement patterns rather than artifact assemblages therefore seem to be a more robust method. It is important, though, that the analysis be rigorously quantitative take into account more than one market center, and account for other factors influencing settlement location. This is particularly important, this last, uh, because most people in antiquity relied on their own produce for their sustenance. So marketing opportunities, while potentially lucrative, were probably less important than production opportunities in influencing settlement location. 
The method I developed to address these challenges has two steps. First, I examine the territories within the immediate vicinity of settlements to inductively determine which environmental factors influence settlement location. Based on the cross-cultural ethnographic work and historical work of Michael Chisholm, I chose a radius of 1.5 kilometers to define the settlement territories. This is the approximate limit of intensive agriculture and therefore circumscribes the area that most influences productive capacity. I compare these territories to the areas around non-sites, places where people could have settled but didn't, and more on these later they turn out to be important. I measure the percentage of the territory covered by different environmental variables and use the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test to determine statistically significant differences. Having selected the influential variables, I combine them into a limited number of principal components and use these as independent variables in a logistic regression analysis. <coughs> this provides me with a baseline model that distinguishes settlements from non-sites purely on the basis of the productive capacity of settlement territories or rather the landscape characteristics of the settlement territories, which I think relate to productive capacities. In the late antiquity, they don't. <clears throat> the model's accuracy is assessed using the root mean square error. I then calculate a second model using the same principal components with the addition of a market potential variable. If the second model's RMSC is lower than the baseline model, then I conclude that the market potential had an important influence on rural settlement patterns. Both the univariate and multivariate analyses are repeated five times with different sets of non-sites to avoid spurious results. By comparing multiple models that use the same production variables, I account for the other factors influencing settlement location. The market potential variable not only allows me to take into account multiple market centers, it also allows me to test whether auxiliary forts should be included as market centers. Market potential is a quantitative representation of marketing opportunities from a given location within a market system. Each marketplace is given a weight according to its purchasing power, population, or in cases such as this where purchasing power and population are unknowable, estimated relative importance. The weight is then divided by the marketplace's distance from the location in question. These quotients are calculated for all centers in a market system and summed to arrive at a single value for market potential. I constructed three different market potential variables corresponding to three hypothesized relationships between auxiliary forts and the rural population. In all variables, cities were given a weight of nine, small towns were given a weight of three, and sanctuaries were given a weight of one. Auxiliary forts were given a weight of three, as shown here, corresponding to the hypothesis that they acted as markets similar to small towns. They were also given a weight of zero, corresponding to the hypothesis that they were isolated from the countryside. And then I tried giving them a weight of negative three to correspond to the hypothesis that they were sites of oppression and abuse that repelled settlement rather than markets that attracted them. So far, I have applied this method in two areas, the Lower Rhine and the Lower Danube. Both areas contain a legionary fortress and several auxiliary forts stationed on a river. Both the Netherlands and Bulgaria maintain national archaeological databases, but it must be said that the Dutch database is more comprehensive and precise. The Lower Rhine data set was compiled as part of the project Finding the Limits of the Limes, led by Philip Verhagen with Mark Grunhausen and Jamie Joyce, and they have also performed a variety of, of transformations on that to make that data set particularly chronologically precise. While the Lower Danube data set was compiled by me in the course of my dissertation research. The environmental data available for these two regions is very different. In the Lower Danube, I relied on modern elevation, soil, and hydrological data to construct variables relating to slope, landform, aspect, duration of direct sunlight, parent, soil parent material, soil texture, and water sources. In total, I took measurements on 52 different variables. In the Lower Rhine, I had the advantage of working with a paleogeographic reconstruction of ancient land cover, which contained six variables. Since the terrain in that area is almost uniformly flat, there is no need to use a DEM. In both the Lower Rhine and the Lower Danube, non-sites are points randomly distributed within the area that is three kilometers away from known rural settlements, which prevents the two types of territories from overlapping. In the Lower Rhine, they are restricted to habitable land cover classes, while in the Lower Danube, the chance of non-site placement in any location is also determined by factors that I found were biasing archaeological preservation and recovery, namely forest cover and distance from modern villages. And if you want to know how I did that, ask me later. Um. 
Because their placement is constrained by the location of settlements, different sets of non-sites were created for each chronological period. The placement of non-sites is also, of course, constrained by the borders of the study area. Since both the univariate and multivariate analysis measure the influence of natural and social environmental factors on a group of settlements, uh, uh, the settlements need to ha be experiencing relatively homogeneous environmental constraints. If they were responding to very different environmental constraints, their behavior would cancel each other out and become invisible in the analysis. So in the Lower Rhine, uh, the finding the limits of the Limes project conducted a cluster analysis of landscapes within 20 kilometers of settlements that identified three broad regions, western, central, and eastern. The western zone is unsuitable for this analysis because of the large areas of uninhabitable peat and the strong influence of fluvial action on the archaeological record. The eastern zone, I have a pointer here, The eastern zone contains large areas of sandy soil interspersed with levees, while in the central zone the levees are surrounded by floodplains and peatland. In the lower Danube, the study area was defined first by those municipalities that were well documented in the National Archaeological Database. Uh, then it was further subdivided into a western and eastern zone by the river Yantra, which flows there which runs along a fault line. To the east, the land is uplifted with irregular hills and deep channels carved into limestone bedrock. To the west, the land is divided into gentle valleys with small streams and low ridges running approximately southwest to northeast. The results of this process are illuminating and somewhat puzzling. I'll begin with the Lower Rhine region. Univariate analysis confirms that levees were favored in both central and eastern zones at the expense of other land cover classes. These are only the land cover classes that were found to be significant uh, using the clean <coughs> overdose runoff test. Preference for levees in both cases seems to peak in the Middle Roman period, which is interesting and fits well with uh, other archaeological data showing agricultural intensification peaking at this time. Turning now to the improvements achieved through adding market potential variables to these land cover classes, uh, the greatest improvements in both zones occurred during the Middle Roman periods. This fits well, again, with recent zoological research showing specialization and greater market orientation in this period. So this is encouraging. In the Eastern Zone, the market potential variable that excludes forts improved model performance the most in every period with the exception of the Late Roman A period. In the Central Zone, it was the variable that it included forts as repellent forces, but the improvement was much more modest, maxing out at just over 5% of the baseline root mean square error in the Middle Roman B period. It's also important to note these hashed lines indicate that the coefficient in the logistic regression model was negative, not positive. So a decrease in market potential actually led to an increase in chances of finding a site. I suspect that this has to do with this area in the northwest of the study region, uh, which has a strong, uh, very low market potential scores, but a lot of these sites, and the combination of that with this area in the southwest, where there's high market potential and quite a lot of non-sites. So this could be taken as evidence that the fort acted as market. This is Velzen, for those keeping track. Uh, but it's not very strong. This variable only improved model performance by 5% as compared to 14% in the, in the eastern region using the variable that excluded forts altogether. In the lower Danube, the results of the univariate analysis showed much more variation between periods in terms of which elements were favored and avoided. So I've only shown here the numbers of significant variables rather than the actual z values, z scores of those variables. In general, the settlements in the western zone show stronger preferences than those in the eastern zone. In particular, the Middle Roman settlements in the western zone differ significantly from non-sites in 14 variables, while late antique settlements in this area, even with a relaxed p-value threshold, only differed significantly from non-sites in four variables. 
there. But the situation is reversed in the eastern zone where the late antique sites differ from uh, the non-set sites in 20 variables and every other period I could only identify three variables where the settlements differed significantly from non-sites. The market potential variables improve model performance more in the west than in the east. In the latter region, the greatest improvement is just over 4%. Here, note the scales on these graphs are important to note. And this improvement comes from the, using the market potential variable that excludes forts. In the western region, though, improvements are much, much higher. The market potential variable that considers forts to be repellent improves on the baseline model by 55%, which is particularly surprising to me because the western region lies at some distance from the forts. If I go back, you can see most of the forts here, or most of the western region lies at a significant tens of kilometers away from the forts. So to try to understand this result, I calculated the standard errors for every settlement and non-site, and then calculated the difference between the standard error obtained using the two most helpful market potential variables. That is, the one that includes forts as negative influences and one that excludes them altogether. As you can see from this map, uh, the market potential variable with negative forts improved the models fit for locations even at a great distance from the frontier. This is about 70 kilometers from the nearest fort. I suspect that this has more to do with an increase in the range of possible market potential variables than the relationship between the military and the rural communities, but I would be eager for your thoughts about this result. In any case, what is clear is that treating forts as markets, giving them a positive weight, fail to improve model performance as much as ignoring them, which suggests that the people living in the countryside were not visiting them regularly to sell their produce. Therefore, any economic influence that the army had in these regions was mediated through cities and small towns. I'll just take a moment to note a few of the limitations that I encountered with this, uh, and then a few of the advantages. First, combining positive and negative market weights led to some unexpected results that are difficult to interpret. Uh, second, the definition of the study area influences strongly the location of non-sites and therefore has a very powerful uh, impact on the results. Finally, it should be noted that different types of marketing activities have different transportation costs and therefore would entail different types of spatial responses to local markets. So the marketing of grain, you only have to carry it to market a few times a year, therefore their transportation costs are lower even though it's a bulky commodity than things like vegetables which have to be transported to market immediately after harvest and therefore require frequent trips. <coughs> the advantages though are significant. I managed to find evidence, I think, for marketing even though production is likely to have influenced location more strongly. I was able to compare radically different data sets on a historically meaningful axis and I was able to apply my method in an area which had a, a does not have a very long history of rural archaeology. I only needed this, the locations and a chronology of the settlements rather than a complete assemblage to, to perform this analysis. Thank you very much.